The agenda is set. I'm Brent Goff in Berlin. It's time to talk. World leaders taking their time on Syria. Is it already too late to act? Lights, camera, politics, the German Chancellor TV debate. Did it make a difference for the voters? And Germany confronting its Nazi past in France. How ghosts continue to haunt. All right, welcome to the show, everyone. I have invited three people today to talk, argue, and pry apart these headlines. My first guest today is Henrietta Heimbach. She is a Franco-German relations analyst at the German Council on Foreign Relations. Henrietta, good to have you on the show today. My second guest is a political campaign advisor here in Germany. He earned his stripes in the U.S. by working on Barack Obama's campaigns in 2008 in 2012. I'm happy to welcome back to the show Julius van der Laar. Julius, good to see you again. And my next guest has spent the last two years helping to smuggle cash from Germany to the rebels in Syria. He is co-founder of Adopt a Revolution, which is based right here in Berlin. I'm happy to welcome to the show Elias Perabo. Elias, good to have you on the show. Let me open up and just let's start with Syria. If the arguments for a military intervention in Syria are so compelling. Why all of this feet dragging? Well, first of all, any strike against Syria without any resolution from the Security Council are going to be a violation, a serious violation of international law. So we have to be really careful on that, of like doing a strike against the sovereignty of Syria. Second of all, um, for the people on the ground, it's not going to help them if we do a strike without a concept of the day after the strike. All right, but we know we're not going to get that UN um, Security Council action, right, Julius? I mean, that, we're not going to get that UN unity. Well, I think it's unlikely at this point. Uh, I think most importantly is public opinion at this point. People are looking to the U.S. to take leadership, and if you look at the polls, 50 percent of Americans are saying they're not ready for U.S. military involvement in Syria. So I think the president is working right now with congressional approval in order to shore up public support get the public behind and then be able to strike in Syria. All right, but the, the judge, you know, the verdict is still out on Washington. And Henrietta, it looks like Mr. Hollande in France, they're actually the only force right now willing to shoot some rockets at Syria. Um, actually, it looks like, but I think they, they won't do it alone. So they wait um, for the decision the Congress will take um, soon. So then we see tomorrow there will be a debate in the um, French Senate. So, but without any vote, so we see how it goes, but he won't definitely do it alone. So. Yeah, exactly. No, no one wants to do anything alone and no one wants to do anything at all right now. Let's, let's get a status check on Syria. Washington, as we heard, is waiting for Congress to give its blessing next week at the earliest. The French, as Henrietta said, are debating intervention this week. Britain is out altogether. The UN Security Council, you can forget that. The Arab League, a lot of talk, no action. And Syria's President Bashar al-Assad, he feels so emboldened that he has warned the world, attack me, and you'll pull the trigger on a Middle East Armageddon. The world has been wrestling with intervention in Syria since the conflict began. But on August 21st, it appeared Assad's forces had crossed a red line. Images of an alleged poison gas attack near Damascus sent shockwaves around the world. An international response looked imminent. British Prime Minister David Cameron led the early push for punitive action, but the use of military force was unexpectedly voted down in Parliament. The United States upped the rhetoric, but President Barack Obama's call for military action eventually came with a caveat. He wants a green light from the U.S. Congress. Some analysts say military strikes could make things even worse for Syrians. For now, the world is waiting, but with the death toll mounting, how long can it afford to? Alias, tell me what the people in Syria that you're in contact with, what are they telling you? Are they telling you that a chemical weapons attack happened? Yes, they do. We and have... who do they say committed that? Well, most of them said it's going to be the government, but honestly, even they told us that is that most of them are not sure about it because how could they tell? They just saw, especially our partners who were very close, they saw rockets fire them. Um, in that area. They don't know really where these workers were coming from, but there's a lot of evidence which shows that it probably is going to come from I the mean, government. How can there be any doubt um, to this? Julius, Henry, Ed, both of you guys can chime in on this. How can there be any doubt? I mean, Assad and his regime, they have the means to deploy chemical weapons. I mean, we're living in a fairy tale if we think the rebels are equipped to deliver chemical weapons, aren't we? Henry, what do you say? 
Well, I think it's not that clear. So as you explained, um, even the people on the ground can't really say um, it was like that. So I would say um, it's, it's so important for international decisions um, to have these evidence that they try to um, collect right now. So it's, I think that would be important for, for a rep, um, response, and why especially is, after Iraq. So, and Julius, think, why is it so hard for the world to believe the chemical weapons story? I mean, go back to Iraq. Huh. Remember uh, the presentation in front of the Security Council and the evidence that was reported, uh, presented uh, with regard to weapons of mass destruction and then having to go back on that. So I think the ramifications could be severe if, in fact, you, you know, base an attack on, on wrong evidence. At the same point, public opinion is just against uh, any sort of involvement. I mentioned 50% in the U.S. Uh, population is against any sort of involvement. The same goes for Germany. Uh, and we just had the vote in, uh, in, in Parliament in the U.K. So uh, the public is against it. You have to be very careful in order to not make any mistakes and not shore up any support against you. Elias, are you for or against a military attack? Well, why don't we start what the people are for in Syria and what our partner said first, because I think it's very uh, good to hear the voices from Syria directly. And when we ask our partners, it was quite surprising that most of our partners who have been for very long against any interventions say at this point, yes, something has to be done and we are very much in favor for this intervention. However, they link it to conditions. They say, first of all, um, any intervention has to only target military targets in Syria. Second of all, um, the intervention has lead to, it cannot be, the, the whole conflict cannot be resolved militarily. So any intervention has to lead to, um, debates has to lead to diplomatic efforts in the end. And what they said third is, um, despite all the debate of intervention, um, what they need, really need on the ground is humanitarian aid as well as aid for the civil project. And this has to be done like really immediately. So the people you're helping in Syria, they say yes to the attacks, but they don't want the attacks to knock Bashar al-Assad out of power. They say they can't. This, this is the thing. I mean, Ash Bashar al-Assad really has a lot of places to hide. He still has quite a lot of people inside Syria who are supporting him. Um, it's going to be very hard against the Syrian military to really do a strike which is going to like defend them in the end. But what's the purpose of a strike then? Either you go in, you wipe out the perpetrator, or you stay out. No, their idea is to weak the military. It's to two degrade, reasons, right? To degrade, to degrade his the capability. Military, exactly. And then you have the Free Syrian Army who should like step in and sort of do the rest. And the second issue is to bring it back on the diplomatic agenda and to bring Syria back into the debate was there sort of nothing has happened during the last like two months. Is there confidence w among the people that you're helping that the, the free Syrian army, that the, the, the opposition, that they will come together and provide a, a better alternative to Assad? Yes, there is. I mean, a lot of people see... They've got a lot of bad PR in the last two years. Very much too. And a lot of people say that's also a reason why the military is like support at the moment. They say what we are facing is that you have the Free Syrian Army on the one side and then there's more and more global jihadists coming into Syria and fighting their own fight. So what they are saying is if the regime stays, stays strong, all the jihadists are going to stay strong because there's a correlation between those two. And what they say, okay, if the regime is going to be weakened, we're going to take care of the Islamists, we're going to take care about the jihadists. Do you trust them? Well, so far, a lot of Syrians have proven that they have done, um, in the opposition fact, they have done quite a lot of stuff. And even on the jihadist stuff, you can see the towns where uh, they're run by the jihadists today, a lot of the civil population are against them, they're protesting against them, they're also fighting against them. There's a lot of fighting between the Free Syrian Army and but, the jihadists. But see, this is, what, this is what I think confuses a lot of people. I mean, you've even wrote that you think a, a solution to this problem in Syria will only come once Iran is pulled to the negotiating table. How can you believe that the jihadists and these extremists, that they will be fought in Syria if you've got the Iranians sitting at the table helping, you know, co-direct the peace plan? Well, I think we have to, to look at two fronts, right? The one is to weaken Assad. And to weaken Assad, we do have to talk to Iran, we have to talk to Russia, and we do have to stop the supply of arms to the Syrian regime. On the other side, Germany and the other Western states should immediately talk to Turkey because most of these global jihadists are going, coming through Turkey to the northern part of Syria and really harming this revolution. So what Turkey has to do is to close their border for these uh, jihadists who are going to Syria. And Turkey's going to tell you that they're doing that anyway, but I mean, look at the numbers coming out this week. Two million refugees now out leaving the country, a lot of them going to Turkey. Julius. Is there any type of international 
concerted effort that is realistic right now? I, mean, I think it's a bad situation and there's no good option on the table. So, you know, what is the president going to do? Is he going to strike unilaterally? He has to wait for Congress in order to get approval, uh, in order to make sure that he has the political backing in the United States. Germany right now is not willing to act um, due to the elections. I think Merkel would be falsely advised to sort of make any move right now. Uh, we're waiting for Britain and France. And so I don't think there's any, any good option that anyone could be taking. Is this still America's game, though? I think it is point? right now. I think we're waiting for what happens in Congress and whether the president is going to decide to take action or not. Is it going to be, Henrietta, in the end, an American-French alliance that's going to go in and take out or at least degrade Assad's capabilities? Um, it really depends on the um, vote in Congress and what it will happen in, in France. But Hollande's not going to allow the, mm. the assembly in, in Paris to decide whether or not he orders a strike, right? Um, He's not going to play an Obama right now. No, it doesn't look like, but um, he could, well, tomorrow there will, will be the debate and no vote, but um, we'll see how it goes. And But I think the French president will go for a vote if he's sure that they, at the, um, um, the assembly, will vote for it. So Yeah. I mean, where is, I'm going to ask all three of you, where is your anger about what has happened here? I mean, whoever committed this chemical weapons attack, it was still a breach of a convention that's almost 100 years old not to use chemical weapons. Doesn't that in itself warrant the international community, the UN included, going in and striking at Assad? Alias. No, what angered me is mainly even the last two years, right? The international diplomatic efforts on Syria. No, but let's stay on the chemical weapons though for a second. I mean, isn't that a reason in itself to strike at Assad? Well, if there's not evidence on the table, um, yes, something has to be done. But it's so, not that easy. That's, that's the whole question but about don't military. But right? do you trust the UN inspectors? Do you trust the UN inspectors? They sure. have said sarin gas was found. Exactly, but they haven't said who have done but, it, right? But, but this yeah. is the whole issue on it. And the other part is, even if you like, even if you go forward emotionally and say, okay, we have to do something, we have to like bomb uh, Syria on this table, the question is what's going to happen after it? And this is also the uh, experience from Iraq. It's not going to help the people on the ground if you strike Assad hard and then he's going to take re revenge again on his own people. It's not going to help the people in Syria. Is, if you're are your people afraid of that? Are they uh, afraid of yes. revenge from Assad? Yes, a lot of them say, okay, if he, they only come in and punish Assad and like leave immediately and we're going to be like in the same mess as before, which is going to be even worse, and then Assad is going to punish us. It's, he's not going to punish the Americans. He's going to punish his own people. All right, what's it going to take for you to be convinced that chemical weapons were used by Assad? <laughs> Evidence on the ground. I think what we need is sort of an investigation by the UN um, who go in and figure out who has done it. But that's, that's probably not going to happen, Julius. And then the ghost of Iraq is haunting us again, isn't it? It's right there at the doorstep. And th so I think the question becomes, what do you do right now? Mm -hmm. Do you send airstrikes? Uh, are you going to launch some, some rockets, uh, cruise missiles? Uh, you know, sort of what you're hearing on the ground is that, from military experts, is that, you know, any sort of military attack is not necessarily going to take out all the chemical weapons. So that's not cer certainly a good option. The second portion, what you just mentioned is, you know, look at the ramifications. If you go in with airstrikes, uh, you know, talking about up to two million refugee uh, refugees that are going to be on the move. So, you know, the humanitarian consequence is going to be severe. And again, there's no end game in sight. What are you going to do? Send but, what, but what about this use of, of chemical weapons? I mean, isn't it up to the U.S. again, or maybe the U.S. and France, to be the world's policeman and to say a breach of this convention will not be tolerated, period? Isn't the U.S. is the only, you know, player in town? I think it's more complex than that. Uh, yes, the U.S. is the only player in town, but at the same time, France is ready to gear up. Uh, Germany has sort of indicated that it will probably play some sort of role, even though the Chancellor is very careful in stating what exactly that role is going to take. But uh, I think there is going to be some sort of intervention. The question is just, is it going to be airstrikes? Is it going to be cruise missiles? Uh, I would imagine that boots on the grounds are very unlikely at this point. Boots on the ground, unlikely, yep. Well, and what about this notion? I mean, aren't you shocked? that the French were once seen in America as these cheese-eating <laughs> surrender monkeys, and now everyone's saying, well, the French are on our side. Well, maybe that's a change in politics, especially when you look at um, Iraq, at the po French politics um, towards the Iraq war. But what I want to say is that actually it really shocks me and makes me angry that um, that there was this um, use of chemical weapons, but it's actually a violation of international war. So it has to be also an international response. It can't be a unilateral 
um, response by the U.S. or by France. So, but Russia and China are going to block any that's attempt, true, yeah. right? So you have to you have to um, find a solution for that, and there would be evidence. So yeah, but where, where's the, where's the anger coming from? Where's the German government uh, at this point saying, "Hey, Russia and China, you guys are dropping the ball on enforcing this international convention on chemical weapons." Well, I think they try it in a diplomatic way. That's what they do right now. Right now, so France is speaking to Russia and to Putin. So, but nothing's going to happen, Julius. Now, because we've got this election coming up here in Germany. Right. right? We got the G20 coming up, and there's been talks that you know Merkel's going to sit down with uh, Putin, and uh, we know the uh, relationship between Obama and Putin is certainly strained. So, yeah, maybe something will come from that, but I think it's unlikely at this point. Um, Alias, um, you have said many times that um, you and your organization adopt a revolution you guys try to keep as much of your activity secret as possible um, do you feel like even today you're being watched and followed by Assad secret police here in Berlin well I'm pretty sure they watch us because they're pretty good in what they do in their secret service so I'm quite sure they watch us but let me just get one point more about this last debate I think we are very, I mean, everybody agrees that something has to be done in favor of this really terrible and horrible crime which has been done in Syria. Um, however, I think that the clue is not only to focus militarily. You could also say, if the Americans want to do something, why don't they sit down with the Iranians and talk about Syria? This would be like a realistic option what they could do. And I mean, why don't they even look into that? And this is what I think is quite a problem, which is like beyond sort of the military strike. That would be, though, and that would be a huge move for Obama to, to agree to that, wouldn't it, Julius? I mean, Can you imagine that happening? If Syria comes out and says any sort of strike on Syria is going to have ramifications with regard to Israel's safety, I think it's very difficult for the president or the White House to sit down right now and talk with, uh, with Iran about any sort of uh, you know, diplomatic resolutions in that respect. So uh, I think you know, public opinion is going to play a huge difference in this, and I mentioned it before. The vast majority of Americans are against it. The president's doing everything to shore public support right now. And I think as much as, you know, atrocities have been committed, uh, I think the president's very well aware of that. But I think, you know, the international community has played a strong role. I think the president's looking at Chancellor Merkel uh, to make a commitment to get engaged. Uh, and at the same time, it's going to be a question of how does the public react in the United States? Yeah, public opinion. Isn't that sort of yeah. the dilemma, right? Because when we talk about a military strike against a country, you're talking about sort of a serious violation of international law doing this strike on the one side. And we say, okay, even in America, the public opinion is against the strike. On the other side, we're talking about diplomatic talks to Iran. So I know it's a big step for America, but also, in spite of what's on the table, I think it's quite necessary to but do I mean, it. It's hard, though, for people to imagine talking with Iran, because Iran is also a system that if they had complete control over Syria, they would not allow the civil society groups uh, that, that you're supporting with no, your money. Sure. So Iran is still, like, deploying weapons to Syria. He's so, I mean, you're asking deploying. the U.S. to basically negotiate with what you would say is the devil. Yes. I think this is sort of what there has to be done, because as far as, I mean, if it continues that Iran is going to deploy weapons to the regime, even if the military strikes, and we don't gonna, we're not going to have boots on the ground, so even if they're going to strike with missiles or from the airplanes, um, we're still going to have the flow of weapons into Syria. And this mm. is just going to be a huge problem. All right, uh, let's move on. Let's bring it um, to Germany for a second. We know that intervention in Syria is a no-go for this country, Germany. Now, confirmation came again this week during the only TV debate between the two candidates who would like to lead the country after the national election later this month. Now, the TV debate, it was a talker on Twitter. I watched it. I tweeted what I was seeing. The tweets that got the most traction were the ones about the color of German Chancellor Angela Merkel's necklace. Well, today we ask, did the TV debate make a difference or was it just another campaign accessory? With three weeks to election day in Germany, this was billed as the main event. A showdown between Chancellor Angela Merkel and her main challenger, Per Steinbrück of the Social Democrats. For Steinbrück, it was a major chance to close the gap in the opinion polls. For Merkel, it was 90 minutes to convince voters to keep the status quo. Both sides came out claiming victory, but the post-debate analysis was inconclusive, showing neither delivered a knockout blow. But the face-off did draw a huge audience. More than 17 million watched on TV and hashtag TV Duel briefly topped the trending charts on Twitter. Although the buzz was mainly about Angela Merkel's German flag-colored necklace.
The election's one and only TV debate is over, but will it make a difference come September 22nd? Yeah, I mean, that's the big question, isn't it, Julius? Is it going to make a difference when people go to the polls on the 22nd? I think it always makes a difference when people go to the polls. Uh, it's an electoral process and now a democratic process, so people should turn out, especially if you look at the numbers from 2009 when we had the lowest turnout in voter history in German history. All right, but that's a nice... PC, comfortable answer, Julius. Well, I think it's true. You is, it go going out to, is it going to influence the vote on the 22nd? The TV debate? Yeah. Uh, I don't think it is. I think why in, not? in order for a TV debate to make any sort of difference in, uh, in a political campaign is, you know, it has to be, first of all, uh, it has to be a competitive race, and right now the race is not that competitive. Second of all, there has to be a clear winner that emerges from a debate, and I don't think either candidate emerged as a clear winner. Uh, and third of all, uh, you have to dominate the week after, the second week after. And right now, the news headlines that we're seeing coming out this week is nobody won clearly. So no clear winner, no decision. No clear winner, no decision. Did everybody here watch the debate? I'm sure everyone yes, did. Um, I'm going to say one word in, to describe it, and you tell me if I'm right or wrong. Boring. Elias. Yes, very much. It was not really a debate, though. It was more uh, both candidates were talking to their audience, not with each other, and this was very boring in the end. Do you agree, Henrietta? I would agree, but it's like, um, because it's about politics, so it's not, in, it's, it's not just entertainment, so um, I think yeah, it was, there was, it was no, mixed, there was, there was no, no there was entertainment. No, action, no entertainment, right, but um, I think it has to be something in between. It was boring, it could have been more um, literally, but um, I think it's an exchange of arguments and it's important for um, the people also to see that the person that they vote are like, um, act responsible, that they can explain their arguments in a, in a objective way as well. Uh, Julius, explain f to our international viewers, why is this campaign, the TV debate included, why is it such a sleeping pill? Right. It's, it's a drag, right? There's no excitement. And I think one of the reasons is that the chance is just so far ahead in the debates. Second of all, there doesn't seem to be a clear alternative. Uh, the distinctions between the SPD and the, uh, and the CDU, the Conservative Party, aren't that great. So there's no narrative, there's no sort of change movement, there's no feeling that people are uh, not satisfied with the status quo, and I think that's a big problem. The great challenge for the SPD, the Social Democratic Party, to sort of get any sort of momentum going are on there no, side. Are there no issues that could differentiate the candidates? There's certainly issues, but when you look at Europe and the Euro crisis... Yeah, is that uh, the number one issue? Well, the, the argument Merkel is going to be making is that, you know, I've navigated Germany through the crisis pretty well. Look at everyone around us. Look at Greece, look at Italy, look at Spain. Uh, they're not doing nearly as well as we are. We're doing pretty well. We have continuous growth uh, and the economy is strong. So there's one argument that's completely taken off the table and any sort of attempt that the opposition is making is going to be knocked down by the chancellor by, you know, sheer economic numbers. What about Syria? We talked about that before, you know, before the show. Syria only came up in the debate in the last 10 minutes of the show. S Alias, couldn't Syria be a, 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 an election winner for the, you know, for Steinbrook, or is it also just a can uh, an issue that no one cares about? I don't think it's going to be an election winner. However, I mean, both were very weak on this topic. Both sort of just said they're not going to go in militarily. They did not say what alternative they would like offer. They did not say anything about refugees. They did not say anything about like humanitarian or development aid going through Syria. And I think this is really an opportunity most, both of them really missed. Well, I think I have to disagree. I think it was smart politics. The polls show 50, uh, 58 percent of uh, German voters are against any sort of German involvement. So any candidate coming out and saying we're going to be more aggressive, we're going to, uh, you know, get involved militarily, I think is a huge mistake politically, and I think that would cost votes. Um, it's not that sort of, uh, you know, situation where Schroeder came out uh, clearly stating that there's not going to be any German involvement in Iraq. Uh, I don't think it's the same mo uh, moment, and I don't think either one candidate. Are the candidates are the candidates lying to the voters about Syria? I would disagree, though, because, I mean, people are shocked in Germany as well about the pictures we're getting from Syria, about the chemical attacks, right? And it's true that you don't go in militarily, but if you would say, okay, due to these pictures, we send in a lot of humanitarian aid, we have sent out our, like, Medi ship from uh, the Bundeswehr or something else, we develop, that's what we are, our strength is in Germany, we send humanitarian aid, that would be a good call, and people would agree on it because they have these pictures in their minds, and all of, a lot of people out there think something has to be done, even if it's not military. Right, but that's what both candidates mentioned during the debate, that there's going to be a support, uh, but there's not going to be any sort of German lead. And why didn't, I, mean, I asked this thing about, about being lied to, because um, Steinbrück, couldn't he have 
looked at Angela Merkel in the face and said, you say today we will not help with any military intervention, but after the election, you're going to be first in line to help any type of international force. Well, I think it's a difficult situation. Let's assume he gets elected. Uh, I think the, the situation on the ground in Syria can change pretty quickly, and uh, public opinion can change pretty quickly. So I think you can't be too, too much on the offense there because you have to, might have to roll back. Steinberg pretty much uh, said, you know, he's not going to be, there's not going to be any involvement, but at the same time, I think he's been around long enough to know that things can change. But I think Syria and foreign policy is not the main issue. I think it's domestic issues that matter the most, and I think that was the main uh, topic of this debate. People are looking at job numbers, people are looking at employment, uh, people are looking at, you know, the, the rents and our pension system, and those are some of the more important topics. But again, I don't think either candidate was able to sort of win the debate over for himself. And if I can just make one, one yeah. last point, uh, going into Election Day in less than three weeks, uh, one third of the German electorate is still undecided. They don't know who they're going to be voting for. And I think that's, that's the critical mass that you can reach here in the debate. So um, you've got a third. Um, they're, they're still on the fence. Um, Henrietta, what about this idea that the Germans just have it too good right now? Low unemployment, mm -hmm. most people have a job. Um, the health care system works for the most part. I mean, the Germans are, you know, they're sitting pretty. Well, I think that might be one reason. Like, crisis always show that, um, like, the, the, the parties at the, at, the, at the edge get more votes. So there could be a reason. Also, economy in, in Europe is getting better and better. So I think it's a point for, for Merkel as well, even when the SPD has done a lot before that as well. But um, I think it's a point for, for Merkel. So it's a very good time for her to have elections right now. And regarding European politics, for example, there's not much difference between um, the SPD and, and Social Democrats and Social Democrats and the um, Conservatives. So, what about these? The, uh, this this third of the electorate right now. How are how are the parties going to get these people? Google wants to introduce all of the candidates online, and in order to have access to this, though, Google gets access to your personal data. That's a huge reservoir. You know what I'm talking about. That's how Obama won. I mean, he had access to the voting patterns and the likes and dislikes of the voters. Is that where Germany is headed to get inside the, the heads of these undecided voters using the internet? First of all, I'd like to reject the premise of the question because I don't think Barack Obama won because any sort of online campaign. I think he won because he had the stronger narrative, because he had the stronger message. Yeah, but you, you, but you wouldn't candidate. argue with me in saying that he used the internet, the strengths of knowing what people like and Ab dislike. Absolutely, and I think he did a fantastic job mobilizing his supporters. Uh, now, there Is were, that happening here? I don't think it is happening to nearly the same extent, and I think there's tremendous potential there. Now. Can you go out and convince anyone to vote just by sort of tweeting at them or posting some pretty Facebook pictures? Absolutely not, especially undecided voters. And a third of Germans are still undecided. They're never going to be convinced by any sort of notion that, uh, you know, they're going to be tweeted at or see some sort of election feat over uh, on Google. Uh, people are only going to be convinced in a personal conversation. If you and I sit together, down together and we talk about personal issues, talk about the issues that matter most to you, and I think that's the greatest challenge for all the parties uh, to when they try to reach uh, uh, undecided. Go out, have personal conversations, activate your base, uh, make sure people talk to their neighbors. I think this is where the main uh, difference can be made in these last couple of weeks uh, in order to reach uh, these undecideds. I mean, you sound like a good electioneering man there, Julius. Do, do you guys agree with him, Elise? Do you agree? I think so. I'm not so much into like social media, uh, so I also think that the narrative is sort of the front thing which has to go first. But how can you say you're not into social media when on the night of the TV debate, um, the event, the TV debate, was the most tweeted event in the world for a few minutes? That's huge. That's tremendous potential there. Are you telling me that the, the Christian Democrats and the, the Social Democrats are just going to yawn and, and, and ignore that? No, it's huge, but it stayed, I mean, the debate stayed boring, right? It did not change the topic of the debate. And still, people went out and said, OK, we undecided because there was no debate, at least on the table. And this hasn't changed because social media was around. Well, I think, you know, if I might, I might charm, charm in there, yeah. What Facebook, Twitter, all these social networks are tremendously effective for is sort of getting your own base rallied, right? Steinberg had some momentum in this debate, and the chancellor made some good points in the debate. And if the CDU and the SPD, the parties, can sort of harness that momentum uh, via the online channels, get people involved in the campaign, 
and have them go out after that, talk to their friends and their families. I think this is where the momentum comes and where it sort of converts into actual votes. But just hoping that because someone retweeted you, he's going to turn out and vote for your party, I think that'd be pretty naive. I mean, have any of you been contacted by any politicians via social media? Nope. Not yet, no. No? I mean, have you seen any type of campaigning on social media? No. I think I mean, every, everyone I mean, has a Twitter account, right? right. Like, well, from I mean, the politicians? A, a lot of people do. Um, I mean, but from the politicians, so, like, wouldn't, I wouldn't say, like, social media, the thing is, it uh, concerns only, like, the young people. There are a lot of, um, we lo have a lot of elderly people in Germany, so I think that's why it's not that, like, it, it's massive, but it doesn't concern every one of the population, so. Okay, and we also have all these posters here in Germany, and, and talk to me, Julius, about these posters. I, I see this, and I feel like it's 1955 all right, over you, again. Right. I mean, okay. posters, that's sort of tradition in Germany, right? Elections, a couple of weeks left, every party puts up posters, tremendous chunk of the budget but campaign. they all look the same. They pretty much all look the same, and you can't really differentiate them. One is yellow, the other one is blue, the other one is green, but that's probably the only distinction. Uh, you know, historically, a tremendous budget of the uh, portion of the campaign budget is invested in, uh, in posters. Sixty percent. Sixty percent. Huge. To, you I know, can't believe at it. At the same time, there is no credible research that shows that posters have any sort of impact. In the U.S., we used to say yard signs, sort of the equivalent to posters. Right. Yard signs don't vote, and I think that's true. Uh, people have to be talked to. No poster with any sort of generic slogan is going to make a difference in getting you either persuade you from voting for one party to but the other. It makes you aware that there's election, actually. <laughs> that, that is true. That is true. But let me ask all of you before we move on, would you be in favor of getting rid of the posters altogether and, and using something else? Henrietta, what would, would you be in favor of getting rid of them? Well, I think, um, well, actually, I don't care. So I think it's, it's most important is that people um, get information about the positions of the parties, that they're aware of that there's election, that they will go there. So I think if posters are a way to, to help with that, it's a good idea. OK. Elias? I think, seriously, I think posters are quite important to tell people that the election is coming up. So But 60% of the budget? Exactly. That's the problem. I think also a lot of these posters can be like left out and the money should be spared somewhere if, else. If we go to sleep on the evening of September 22nd and wake up on September 23rd, will we have missed anything? Julius. Uh, as long as we've voted beforehand, uh, we've probably uh, done everything we could have done. But at the same time, I think this election is important. People should go out and make sure their voices are heard. And, uh, but will we have missed anything, Julius? Probably not. Probably not. That's what, Henry, what do you think? Well, you never know what, what will change. So I'm not sure if the results right now is, will be the same. So can be everything. Can be a um, big coalition. coalition okay. So All right. Like, Alice, um, what do you think? Will it be a sleeper or will we see something important? I think it's going to be a sleeper. A sleeper. All right. There we go. That's what I wanted to hear. All right. Let's move on now. Germany, as we all know, there's the camera, is considered a role model around the world for confronting the ghosts of its past. This week, for the first time ever, a German president will visit the French village of Orador. Now, that's the site of a Nazi-led atrocity. Germans aren't talking much about the visit. Instead, a viral, satirical video about killing a young Adolf Hitler is getting much more play and much more chatter. And it begs the question, what is the best way to remember an ugly history is being irreverent, the modern way of showing respect? This is the French village of oradour sur glane Joachim Gauck will be the first German president to set foot here, the site of one of the worst Nazi atrocities during World War II. In June 1944, Nazi soldiers killed 642 civilians here, hundreds of them children. Only six villagers survived. Today, Oradour is a ghost town, the ruins preserved as a memorial to the dead. It won't be the first time that Joachim Gauck has confronted Germany's painful history. As president, he's also paid tribute to Nazi victims in Italy and the Czech Republic. But at home, Gauck's visit to France hasn't been a big talking point. Instead, a student film has gone viral. The fake ad shows a car running over a young Adolf Hitler. Adolf. Poor taste, or just another way to deal with Germany's Nazi past? I mean, over a million views on that video. Is it poor taste, or is it just a mature country recognizing what happened in its ugly past, Henriette? Well, I think it's a difficult question, but first, when you watch the video, it's shocking. So you see that um, still people in Germany kind of um, 
deal very carefully with the parts as well. So because if it wouldn't be shocking, so no one, nobody would watch the video. So um, you see that there is enough. Um, um, uh, it's it's is important. It yeah. Is it good? The video. Mm -hmm. I think um, I think it's okay to do that. Yes. I mean that's saying a lot. Julius, what do you say? I thought the video was well executed. Uh, the narrative is there right now. Gauk is visiting France. Uh, the sort of historic moment is set. And so, you know, entering the social media sphere with a video like that, especially if it's well produced and the, uh, you know, message is sort of on point, uh, makes sure that, you know, it gets picked up by the media and sort of spreads virally. At the same time, I think the significance of the event and the visit, and when we look back at history, I think the pictures that we see from, you know, uh, from, from history are so grave that you have to look at this, uh, uh, you know, with respect and with humility. Elise, what do you think? I would very much agree with the two others. I mean, I'm not a much better fan about this video at all because it has a lot of violence in it. However, it at least puts some light on sort of the events which is coming up on the Gauk visit. But isn't it a good thing that young people are, you know, talking about what happened and um, can, they're using the language of social media today to, to get a point across. I mean, isn't that something we should be celebrating? Yes, we should. And, but the question is, do we have to make a video where a child is run over by a car um, to, point, to get out this message, right? I mean, does it have to be and that And he's run much? over by a German car. He's run over by a German car. That's that, there's, a, there's a lot of subtext there. There's a lot of subtext, yeah. that's true. But I mean, still, it's a child in the end, right? And, and so I'm not so much convinced if we really use this sort of brutal message or this brutal pictures to get the message but out. But isn't the question being asked there, and this is something that maybe in German society no one wants, wants to, to say out loud or to talk about, is if you had had the chance, if you could go back in time and you could run into a, a small Adolf Hitler, wouldn't you also have run over him? It's a difficult question to ask because, right? I mean, because it's a small child in the beginning. If you would like go back and say, should the sort of attacks against Hitler later on, should they have been so successful? But if you knew that was going to happen, I mean, that's that's what this video is asking you to pretend. Well, I don't think. First of all, I don't think it's only about Hitler, right? It's a whole society who was sick at the moment, and to just focus on like this one person who is at the lead, which is clearly very important, but it's sort of not enough. It's a sick society we had uh, in that time. And I think we have to like look in past, not only like focus on this one person. What do you say, Julius? I think it's good to have the debate, and I think it's good that young people are getting involved and sort of taking a look at this and taking a stab at it from the from the different perspective. But there's so much, only so much you can communicate in 30 second video. But it's a uh, lot. It's, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's and a lot. it sort of, you know, it gets the debate going. But I think it has to be opened up. And I think uh, it would be nice to sort of have more information provided on top of the video, uh, maybe create a campaign all around it. Yeah. But um, I think they've done a fantastic job sort of raising the issue in the public debate. Henriette, what about the importance of Orador? I mean, it's not getting a lot of play here in Germany. What about for the French? Um, it's a bit different for, for France. There's a lot of uh, media coverage, but it has been um, in Germany as well when um, Gauck in announced that he would go there. The president. Yeah. The pro um, president um, Gauck go there. So um, there's media coverage in France because it's, um, it's a very important um, like event or memory in, um, in France, actually. So it's taught in schools. and um, what, is, what is taught in school? In Germany, the, coming to terms with the past, accepting the, the identity of being the perpetrators, those are things that are hammered in to students here. Mm. Do the French dedicate the proper amount of time to the Vichy regime and the fact that they collaborated with the Nazis? Well, that changed over time as well. So, like in the early years after the war, there were um, purges um, to to actually um, find um, collaborationists, and um, they were killed, and they were also trialed. And then there was a time where nothing happened actually. And in the 90s, with Chirac, there was a lot of investigations, and um, Chirac also stated that um, the French state has an um, plate in like has a responsibility actually. So there was a lot of um, um, changes in the 90s and right now as well, but it's still ongoing. So it's, um, but the, the French, they acknowledge the atrocities and they, they also see that um, they, some of them played, and played a role in it and have a responsibility. Let me ask all of you, since all of you um, at the table are Germans, what should President Gauck say or do at Orador? Elias. Well, it's hard to say. I mean, first we just say, should say like a, uh, his condolence and his big sorry to the people out there, and he should like admit the guilt, which is on the German people, um, 
uh, which the crimes they have done there and to work uh, further to sort of um, keep these crimes in mind and sort of to go from there. Do you agree, Julius? Uh, I do, but I think the polyoptics are more important. I think it's sort of the pictures that we're seeing, uh, the, the gesture of a German head of state going over there, uh, reaching out and sort of telling people this is not going to be forgotten. I think that's the most, most important message. But that's been said. That's been said time and time Well, again. I think you have to say it over and over, but at the same time, I think the debate that we're having here, and the, I think that the debate that the viral video might be spark, uh, sparking as well, is that, you know, at the same, while, while we can't forget something like that and the tr atrocities that have been committed, at some point we have to move on. We have to sort of, you know, move beyond, sort of make sure that we understand this is a generation that's past us. You know, there's, you know, not, we don't have any sort of uh, guilt anymore. Uh, while the prosecution is rolling up the case again and might bring charges again, I think it's important that we as a society that, get it, to a point. That is that true, though? Is, are you, is your generation, are you a guilt-free German generation? I think... While we remember uh, what happened and sort of we see the, the significance and we're, of course, committed to not forgetting, I think, you know, there's certainly uh, something that we can't be held responsible for. And I think at some point uh, we have to be able to say proudly and loudly that we're Germans and we should feel, 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 feel compelled to, to say so. So, and, and what do you say? Actually, I think it's, um, it's, it's still important to, that these visits take place. So I think there's, um, there's never an end to that, and it's very important to Franco-German relationships as well, because these symbol symbolic um, gestures, as you said, they are so important for creating um, these relations, a special relationship between France and Germany. So you, you need these pictures, actually. But do you feel see. guilty? I mean, are you a generation free of guilt? That's my question. Well, um, I can't really tell you um, just like that if I feel guilty or not, but it's part of my history, it's a part of our history, so um, I'm kind of aware of it, and you learn it in school, and you, you know what happens, so it's... Um... Well, briefly, I, I briefly. Like the symbolism, there are still two survivors, uh, you know, from the, that instance, you know. And, and should we still be sending the, the perpetrators to prison, I, even I if they're in their 90s? Be. Yes. Justice should be served. Okay. We're, we're running out of time here, but let me ask all of you, I mean, since we've been talking about the election and politics so much, after September 22nd, who will be the Chancellor of Germany? Steinbrück or Merkel? Sadly, Merkel. Close Julius. elections, you got to go vote. Give me an answer, Julius. I think right now the numbers are looking in favor for Merkel. Okay. Henrietta? I agree, actually. It's probably Merkel. Okay. Thank you very much, all three of you, for being honest. I think we've got a politician on our hands here. That's going to wrap up my agenda this week. Keep the conversation going. Chime in at Facebook and Twitter. You can tweet me at Brent Goff TV. I'm always happy to see what you folks are thinking. And remember, our inbox is always open. You see the address on your screen right there. Don't forget, you can watch the show again on our website and on YouTube. I'm Brent Goff in Berlin. Join me next time when I set the agenda.